and welcome to My Career in Data, a podcast where we discuss with industry leaders and experts how they have built their careers. I'm your host, Shannon Kemp, and today we're talking to Jackson Rep from HarperDB. With a robust catalog of courses offered on demand and industry leading live online sessions throughout the year, the Dataversity Training Center is your launch pad for career success. Browse the complete catalog at training.dataversity.net and use code DBTalks for 20% off your purchase. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer at Dataversity and this is My Career in Data, a Dataversity Talks podcast dedicated to learning from those who have careers in data management to understand how they got there and to keep talk with people who help make those careers a little bit easier. To keep up to date in the latest in data management education, go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Today, we're joined by Jackson Rep, the field CTO at HarperDB, and normally, this is where a podcast host would read a short bio of the guest, but in this podcast, your bio is what we're here to talk about. So, Jackson, hello and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so glad you're here, and it's so nice to meet you. Um, So, tell me, okay, so you're the field CTO at HarperDB, so tell me about HarperDB. HarperDB is a distributed application platform. So even though we have uh, the letters DB in the name, and that's certainly what we started out as, uh, the journey to product market fit is uh, is a long and unique one. And uh, we found that no matter how high performance and distributed your database may be, the end-to-end latency always sort of involves so many other moving parts, uh, chief among them, the API endpoints that perhaps you use to fetch that data, um, and the in-memory cache that you use to speed up access to disk, uh, disk store data. And, and we eventually evolved to a place where in order to control our own destiny and to really you know, effectively guarantee you know, an SLA of X milliseconds, uh, we needed to combine all of those moving parts into a single product. And ultimately, this distributed applica- application platform is, is what was born of you know, our dream to build something that was easy to use and would reduce complexity, but then also our customers needs to guarantee the distributed architecture didn't overwhelm them with complexity. Sure. So tell me, so as a field CTO, what is your role? What is a field CTO and what do you do for the company? My role is primarily interacting with uh, two groups, two main constituents. One, I have our technical team who is building product and prioritizing features and and looking to the market to understand what is going to enhance our product market fit, increase our total addressable market, uh, what what little things we add that add great value, what longer term things need to be moved up, uh, you know, and how that opportunity uh, evolves as we're out there in the real world um, and do things, new interests, new trends sort of occur. And on the other side, I am working with customers to help them understand how to architect a solution that takes mm-hmm. advantage of a distributed platform, as well as you know, use case number one, maybe something as simple as putting your APIs and data out on the edge. And that's pretty easy for us. But as a platform, we are built in such a way that you can add new modules, new functions, new applications. So how do we architect those and how do we scope those in terms of compute resources required? And do I need another cluster or can I just upsize this cluster? And what is my SLA and and how many nines do I want in terms of uptime? So I help work with customers sort of define those applications, help them scope the infrastructure that we will spin up on their behalf. And then when there are missing pieces that would keep us from delivering the complete solution, to go to the product team and help prioritize those things to meet our customers' needs. Oh, very cool. And, and you know, I made a very big assumption, um, probably a pretty safe assumption that CTO stands for Chief Technology Officer. That is correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't want to presume that people know what acronyms mean, um, but, uh, and certainly for my own acronym, CDO, it can mean many things. So I never <laughs> want to assume. Well, that's very cool. Um, and I love that you're working with the the customers as well. I assume that's where the field uh, 
portion of your title comes in. That is um, that is correct. I have just enough technical knowledge to make me dangerous, but not so much that you would want me to absolutely be in charge of like engineering. I'm with you there. I, I completely can re I can completely relate to that. So so tell me, how do you work with data in your typical work week? A lot of it is understanding how I'm trying to solve the problem. So mm -hmm. people come to us with challenges around latency. They come to us mm -hmm. with challenges around certainly cost, infrastructure, hyperscaler, you know, vendor lock-in. And they, and they bring me a use case and they tell me how they have solved it given the paradigm of, you know, sort of modern application architecture where there, there may be a lot of moving parts. They may all be hosted in, you know, some hyperscaler like AWS or Google Cloud, and but there's still a lot of moving parts there. And their pain point is cost or latency. So a little bit of it is we could recreate the architecture you possess with fewer moving parts and, mm -hmm. and deliver this. Or how can I dive in and understand a little more holistically, not just this application, but let's talk about your organization as a whole. How, can, how could this paradigm benefit other groups? And how do I not just build a feature for this one stakeholder in your organization and instead build something that could be reused by other business groups? Or in the best of all possible worlds, I build a component that drops into your installation of RPDB that, that delivers you all of the functionality you want. But then a generic version of that gets put into our add-ons repository and can serve as a jumping off point for other customers who might have similar challenges. Very interesting. So you're measuring latency, obviously, and it still blows me away. I, I mean, I'm dating myself to, to, you know, when we talk about milliseconds, um, you know, it's, it's so funny to hear that word and, and think on those terms, even though I, you know, in my day-to-day -day use, I, you know, I would love software and tech to be faster than it is even right now. And it's so much faster than it was 10 years ago. But, um, <laughs> and, and it sounds like you're doing a lot of ROI work for your customers as, as well in terms of, uh, cause you mentioned cost. Yep. So looking yeah. The, a lot of data there. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the paradigm that we, the, the challenge we're always trying to solve is, is a single digit number, right? It's just numbers that they want to keep below a certain point or above a certain point. But, but the solution itself, when you are moving from a database and an in-memory cache and an API gateway and an API server and, you know, endpoints and code of maybe Lambda functions, serverless functions, like you've got all these parts and the fact that we, our platform handles all of those tasks, you know, in one installable package is a very real, you know, challenge for a lot of old school architects like me who grew up, you know, with separation of concerns and, and redundancy. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to treat it as a single product, eventually it clicks that having more than one node is your resiliency, is your separation of concerns, is, is the way we divide up the system now, rather than vertically dividing it. Um, right. In order to achieve scale and be closer to users, we horizontally divide it. Makes sense. So well, let's back it up a little bit. So Jackson, tell me, you know, when you were just a kid, you know, say six years old, was this the dream? Did you think I'm going to grow up and be a field CTO at this company <laughs> working with uh, Harvard D D DB? I it was I'll, a dream. I'll flash forward. I'll flash forward to age eleven, maybe age twelve. 11. Yeah. So. We were the first family in the neighborhood. My mom's boss bought us an Apple II Plus computer. And oh, uh -huh. we had an Apple II Plus computer when nobody else had anything. Yeah. But there was one piece of software that allowed you to access stock quotes on a 15 minute delayed basis. And this was, and I'm not going to date mm -hmm. myself, but it was a long time ago. You, you, if you want to know the price of your stock, you either called your broker or you looked in the paper the next day, or you, right. you watched cable TV and you hoped that it went along the crawl across the bottom of the, of the screen. And that was how you knew whether or not you'd made money or lost money that day. And my father was very interested in, in, in better granularity. And so he, he convinced my mom's boss to buy an Apple II plus 
he bought that software and then he sent me off to coding boot camp uh as a sixth grader to learn wow. how to operate to learn how to operate it so that he could get stock quotes and then i stopped as soon as i entered high school and discovered girls and i didn't touch a computer again until after i graduated college wow. um and yeah. And I was a copywriter and I wanted to put my copy onto a website uh, because it was done. But the guy who did that was out that day and I taught myself enough to FTP it up there. And then that really upset that guy and he quit. And then they gave me his job and I'm like, I am not qualified to do this at all in any way, shape or form, but I get it. And then after immediately hiring somebody who knew more than me, um, who could actually do the, the core tasks, I set myself to learning by taking online tutorials and stuff. And at some point, everything clicked. I was like Neo in the matrix. I saw all the code. I got it. Yeah. JavaScript made sense to me. And I'm like, I'm crediting wholly that basic programming boot camp from when I was like 11 years old that all of a sudden put that logical structure and process into your mind. And then everything yeah. else became easy and it, the language didn't matter. It was syntax, logic right. and, and processing. And, and that's kind of how I accidentally ended up here. Oh, that's very interesting. So what did you major in? Social sciences, <laughs> emphasis in marketing and e economics. And yeah. it took me, it, I told my father, it takes lots of people six years to graduate from college. Um, <laughs> and, and he yeah. informed me that those people are called doctors. So I, I enjoyed college. I'm not sure I learned very much then. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's just the experience uh, of when you get into the workforce. Okay, so so you start learning code. So what job are you doing now? So where did you go from there? So from that from that advertising agency, who hired me as a copywriter, and then eventually made me director of internet. Um, I was poached, went to a pure digital agency, and this mm -hmm. is this is before the dot-com crash and we were charging people a million dollars to build them a website that now you could build in WordPress in five minutes, but we were the only ones who could do it. And, and, and man, there were so many snacks and, and we were more than happy. We worked 24 hours a day because it was exciting and it was new. And, you know, over time, you know, the, the, the industry matures and you can't all just be cowboys A process takes place. And, and I began to, I began to look at code, not just as a personal achievement, it's more clever than the last one I wrote, or it's a little more performant. I began to look at the, the solutions and the problems and ways to abstract what I had built into almost components that I could glue together so that I would have to work less. Um, usability and user experience guidelines and rules and, and, and templates that I knew that if I put there, customers would complain less and they wouldn't demand documentation because I inherently uh, didn't want to write documentation. So I really focused on user experience so that it was so easy to use that nobody needed documentation. So then I didn't have to write any. Oh, mm -hmm. That's in so interesting. I, you know, I've, the first person I've talked to who was part of that uh initial web development craze because you're right I mean it was so not many could do it it was a lot more difficult <laughs> it was it was more challenging and yeah. I mean it had to look good on every browser and the back end mm -hmm. languages were insane I mean everything about it was the wild west and it was yeah. a great deal of fun I yeah. learned a lot um but at the but at the end of the day writing code was one of those things that for some people, and I'm very much among them, that I can put on my headphones, open up my ID, start typing, and then it's like 9 p.m. And right. the whole day just disappeared and I didn't, I don't even know where it went. And also I was supposed to pick up my kids at three. So at a certain point you need to like recalibrate yourself and decide maybe right. that's not the highest and best use of my time. Also, I, you can't leave your children at school indefinitely. Yeah, no, that 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 doesn't tend to work. They often. frown on that. Yeah. Okay. Well, so where did you go next? What, what was next? Uh, I left. I left the pure digital agency because uh, because we all left. Um, yeah. It was one of those massive like, all right, group three, please enter the conference room. Bye. Like, okay, well, fine. 
eventually I got a, I got a job at an advertising agency that had a small digital practice. And I say small, it was one person. And mm -hmm. he was building the brochure where that would accompany the campaigns that we were doing in this, you know, five person advertising agency. And I brought a, enough additional knowledge from my time at, you know, this digital, this digital shop to say, let's, let's reinvent the way we do these brochure wear sites. And I got to work for very cool clients. We weren't great at making money, but we were really good at like selling, you know, cool functionality. So online configurators for sunglasses where you were swapping out uh, CGI generated things that were red and blue and green. And then you would choose basically what color you wanted your sunglasses to be click buy and then you would get those sunglasses in that color. So the online custom configurators, which we then landed an automobile client. And that was amazing because it was one of the, it was a cool brand and we loved working with them and, and we all got cars from the dealership, you know, on a, on a nice. decent lease deal. And yeah. we were, we were rock stars. It was fun, but it was also so cyclical in nature. Advertising is this campaign is running and we need to launch this and you pour everything into it and you make a lot of money and you launch it and it's super cool. And maybe you get an award at the, you know, at the, at the um, open bar event that happens in, in February, but then next quarter we throw it away and we start over and we launch another thing for another campaign. And I really, I was at the point of my craft where I wanted to love and nurture and build something. And so mm -hmm. I left and I joined, I, I started consulting for one of our clients as their kind of in-house technical person, CTO, mm. and and started loving and nurturing them. And that was my first of, this is my eighth up, that was my first. And mm. I I learned a lot about everything that wasn't code. Because at that point, the code was easy. And right. it became, is this the right product? Is the market ready? Is this the right leadership mm. team? Are, are my coworkers sinks of energy or are they are they fonts of productivity and and beginning to not get just enamored with the idea of having a job yeah. uh or even enamored with the idea of a product that seems really really cool it became the larger issues that every startup wrestles with is product market fit and and am i just building this for myself am i am i leaving a, a single pain point that i have because it upset me yesterday and nobody else has ever had this problem and, and certainly no addressable market ever will. Um, so being able to understand that the power to build things, which you possess when you are a developer, when you are making use of you know, data to, to change theoretically the world, um, you, you shouldn't build everything just because you can, the Jeff Goldblum line, right? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, and even less does it mean that you should try to build a business on top of it. So I think the the journey that I took was throwing throwing noodles against the wall and, and seeing what sticked because they were all great ideas and they were all nice people and they were all cool and they all felt timely. Um, but only two of them ever amounted to anything. And, and the rest I call learning opportunities because I absolutely plucked you know, pieces of information about how to build a career, how to cobble together a career with a liberal arts degree in a highly technical space where other people are coming from, you know, now degree, degree programs specifically aimed at distributed systems. Right. And, and some of it is just time in the industry. And like, I've, I've watched the theory fall apart, like Rodney Dangerfield and back to school where, you know, he's in a business class and he's like, yo, what about all the bribes? And, and the instructor's like, no. And he's like, oh yeah, hundred percent. And I'm like, I've got, I've got toggles in Linux subsystems that I, that I switch on because I know it's going to be, it's going to hurt me a year from now. And so by default, this thing is always switched off or on or whatever it is. So you learn from experience and you aggregate that. And then, and then at a certain point, you, you begin to see other people coming up through the system that are you know, maybe not specialized, just like you weren't specialized. And you can give them that one little thing and say, this isn't a career, but this is 100% going to make your next boss feel like you know what's going on. And that's all we're doing. We're trying to build people, build teams and build companies. And, you know, my focus 
you know, in these early stage startups, um, which is where I still technically consider HarperDB as we close our Series A here in the next uh, few days or a few weeks. Um, nice. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's been everybody wears different hats. And as you start mm -hmm. to specialize, now you have to worry about the people and you look back on your own journey and you say, did I have mentors? Yes. Were they technical people? Very few of them. Very few of them. I mean, there's there's always the smartest guy you can think of in your entire career. And you learn a lot of really smart things in this vertical about your job. But the other people may not have anything to do with with technology. They are truly managers of people and organizations and expectations and customers and 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 deal flow and like how does this organization respond to crises or opportunities right. you know we can't just throw away every priority every time somebody walks in the door and how do you engage that discipline and then more importantly you know make it easier for other people to say no because that's that's kind of the superpower you have to develop over time is the ability to understand where your personal limits are, right? Don't abandon your children until 9 p.m. Um, or, or where your company limits, your resource limits, your financial limits are as an organization as you try to figure out what product market fit might be. I love this story for so many reasons. I, I mean, it what you're talking about fits into exactly why we started this podcast, because especially in uh, you know the data space, and you're right. And there's a lot of degrees now in computer science and distributed systems. And but um, but there's no degree for data architecture, or, uh, data modeling, uh, those kind of jobs. You know, it's and so many data practitioners do. There's no linear path. I've interviewed so many people who have so many different backgrounds. Um, you know, one went was I've interviewed very you know a lot of filmmakers. <laughs> <laughs> screenwriters uh, who went into data and it's just, a, it's fascinating. And I love that you follow your passion and that, that you talk about, um, and you're talking about taking chances and uh, that, you know, you, you, uh, a couple have taken off and, and, but it's been a, not always easy, but it's been a fun road. More and more companies are considering investing in data literacy education, but still have questions about its value, purpose, and how to get the ball rolling. Introducing the newest monthly webinar series from Dataversity, Elevating Enterprise Data Literacy, where we discuss the landscape of data literacy and answer your burning questions. Learn more about this new series and register for free at dataversity.net. Very, very interesting. So tell me, so what has been your biggest lesson so far in your career as you especially as you go through all these startups i think ultimately and, and one of the reasons i find this podcast super interesting is is it all comes down to the underlying data the job i had before harper db was in a low code iot platform mm -hmm. collecting sensor data and, and activate actuating you know valves and stuff like that but but i needed a database that could persist things and and move data around and i did an internet search found harper db built a block for it so i could drag it into my into my platform and and it worked some of the documentation was off so i i rewrote their postman collection and i sent it back to them and i said hey just just so you know and, and they invited me in and the first thing they you know the, we get past the basic introductions and they say okay your your test is draw slack just draw draw it up on the whiteboard there and I started with database tables. I started with attributes and, mm -hmm. you know, it was a, it's a, it's a really simple relational architecture. It's, it's not a big, you know, for, 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 for just a demo, it, it didn't have a lot of columns, but if you don't start there, I really fail to see how you can tell the story. It's not that you can't draw it starting with the WebSocket servers, you know, talking to the clients in those sessions. But if I'm trying to sell you on me, my ability to draw this out, or a customer on how we're going to solve a problem that deals with data and latency, I, I have to start with, you know, the, the source of truth. And, and how am I going to tell the story other than like, here are your things. When you ask for this endpoint, you're going to need to get data from these two tables and join them. 
And that is a very expensive operation. So we need servers here that can cache that. And, and if I want to deliver changes to that in real time, I need change data capture. So I'm going to need a hook in there and I need to broadcast that out. And I could use PubSub via WebSocket. And that's cool, except if I have lots of people, I need more than one WebSocket server. And how do I scale that? And eventually the drawing was done. And I am told to this day that of, of the many people who were far more qualified than me to take this job, I was the only one who told the story and drew it correctly. And, and, and it made sense by the yeah. time other people may have driven, drawn it differently. And it may have been just as functional and just as correct. But I think on some level, it, it felt like I could turn around in a hat in a company where lots of people have to wear lots of hats. I could turn around and tell the customer that story too. And if it made sense to everybody in this room, it might stand a better chance of making sense to people who could give us actual money. Um, and, and largely, if I look at my job today, it is very much telling the story of distributed computing and a journey from where you are to where you need to be and how it's not necessarily just a pure IT story. It's not just, you know, IT is obsessed with squeezing out reliability and like lowering the cost per request by a fraction of a fraction of a penny. And that's their, that's their remit. But application owners, product owners, those people have huge budgets and they're willing to spend a little bit now to gain efficiencies, you know, an order of magnitude larger than IT is necessarily considering. Um, and they'll do it on much shorter timelines if you can, if you can execute. So we have found our, our sort of niche, um, not so much going to the, the architecture of those data tables, although it inevitably ends up there. It is the value prop of this integrated stack and, and how we are going to deal with data alongside the applications. So we we feel like a distributed system is best kind of represented as a CDN for applications and the data that power them. And that's, that's ultimately what we're selling and, and being able to tell that story effectively, um, I think is the thing that I, for, for better or worse, um, seem to have intuited early and and it's kind of gotten us where we are well i'm guessing that your uh liberal arts degree and your time so much time spent in advertising helps your ability for storytelling and uh communicating uh in a way that's understandable to others that and my uh that in my extremely brief career as a stand-up comedian yes all of those oh. things like can shield together i think yeah there are there is the there is the paradigm of 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 nerds who don't have social skills and and people who have salespeople who literally couldn't code their way out of a paper bag, and I don't proclaim to be a great salesperson or a a really great developer, but I'm just dangerous enough in both regions and and the overlap is there enough that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sell something that doesn't exist. And I'm and I'm not going to architect something that is so complex it can't be sold. I don't want to touch on that though. So do you, do you you spent some time as a comedian? I did. Um, I had a I had a breakup uh, when I was 24 years old, and okay. my my grief processing uh, was non-existent because you don't nobody nobody does that when you're 24. Uh, but a we were I had a bunch of people over and we were watching the Seinfeld finale, huh? and somebody called for my ex on the landline because we used to have landlines, and I picked up and they're like, "Hello, is 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 Sarah there?" And I'm like, "No, Sarah's not here." And I I realize now I'm in front of everybody on right. the phone during commercial break, so I'm not and I'm like, "No, she's uh she's not here. She moved out about a year ago in a fit of." anger and resentment that in many ways, you know, since she left, I, I realized that's probably my fault. Maybe I have unrealistic expectations. It, and I just oh, went on yeah. this little thing and enter, trying to entertain yeah. my friends. Right. And it turned into, it turned into a, a, a tight five related to the five stages of grief and nowhere sure. are they more evident than when a telemarketer calls your house after your ex has moved out. And I, I parlayed that into, you know, appearance at local comedy clubs. And I realized the next step was for me to 
get in a car with four other comedians and drive around the country and share a motel room. And I was like, eh, but I have a job and it pays me really well. So I just, I don't think comedy is going to be my thing. But I have every once in a while, if, if a relationship ends or I go through like something I need to process, that generally is the way I process it through storytelling, which oh, I love it. You know, yeah, yeah exactly. that's very healthy. And you're actually not the first person uh, in the podcast to have a, a dabbled in a comedy. So I love that because it does it does help the communication skills and standing up like that in front of others is a hard thing to do. So. So props to you for for uh, that. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll say like you, you can be in any meeting pitching to a customer and they will never just groan in mass at your at your ideas and your face right there like a comedy audience will. So, you know, right. I'm, I'm, it, it builds you up a lot. You're like, you got a resilience. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that didn't land. But how about distributed systems? I love that. That's awesome. Um, yeah, you know, we get a lot of requests for that for training for for communication, just how to how to communicate better. So, and Absolutely. we're actually adding that to our our catalog because it, it is it's it's a hard skill. Um, so, I'm not, I love it. So, tell me then. Um, now, having worked with data for for a while, you know, what is your definition of data? I suppose data is the underlying truth. Data is the thing that it might not always be true for everybody, but as far as the contract with my application goes, it's truth. And I need to take care of it. And I need to make sure that it remains true. I need to not corrupt it. I need to be able to march forward and believe that every time somebody asks for that data that it adheres to the rules to the contract that we have set up um one of my like uh our head of strategy who's you know more over the pure technology angle he said to me i live in constant fear of exactly one thing that a paying customer would be using our product and their data would disappear and that we would no longer have a company and that is that is a fear he instilled in me and it is, yeah, I'm, I'm less afraid as the project pr product has gotten more and more mature. We don't have those errors, right? We, we have lots of checks and balances to make sure that his greatest fear never came to fruition. I, mm -hmm. I would think that my, mm -hmm. my walking into any given room, my apprehension about any given project is that we, we architect it in a way that makes sense to the people that are going to be maintaining it going forward because it is such a new paradigm. So many people have had the database and the API and the cache and being able to convince them that, I mean, the latency benefit is obvious, the security, not having a man in the middle because there is no middle. All of that right. seems really obvious, but then you get to practice, right? Then you get into actual practice and their decades of experience in the industry or their education and their degree in distributed systems and all the moving parts comes back in and you you have to do a lot of bake-offs and you have to prove your point and you have to ensure them that data, whatever it is, is still truth, no matter how we choose to persist it and, and access it and deliver it. All of those layers were just extra because we hadn't figured out what the truth, the true underlying truth and the need for you know, requirements around marshalling that data was. And now we have a really good idea because we built lots of applications. So the best practice for data has changed, but the best practice for everything that lives on top of it is what we're trying to improve. Oh, very, very nice. Um, and I love that you uh, talk about it in the terms of contracts. Um, I, I love that. As a, as a developer who has very much been on, you know, the application side and and the data side was, you know, a PhD from MIT and they oversee the Oracle cluster and you can't even, I don't even know the, I don't even know the address of that server. Like that's so far removed from me. All I get is I hand you a thing and you hand me back a thing and we've agreed that those are going to match and that's the contract. And it's a very 
enterprise way to approach data management, data governance, data security. But more and more in the same way we've seen infrastructure as code with Terraform, right? I have a, I have a template and I, I can modify it and I can redeploy new infrastructure like that. And it's super easy and DevOps, you know, exists because now all of a sudden developers can say what they need to deliver their application. And, and we are building a system that allows developers to declaratively define their data structures, define those relationships. Now, will they be necessarily as, as thoughtful and educated and, and will their solution be as performant as you know, something architected by a DBA with 20 years experience? No, probably not. But if, if I could build a platform that would let you get started and had a lot of methods and handlers and backend processes to optimize your structure, to make recommendations, perhaps in terms of performance, and to get you closer and closer to being a full stack, including the data developer. So you can be a data architect because ultimately, I know what I want to put on a web page, or I know what the API, I, I know what I want to send it, and I know what, what I want back. I know what the contract is. Everything else should be as intuitive as possible. And the fewer, you know, the fewer fiefdoms I enable in the process, the, mm -hmm. I feel like the more productive organizations get to be. Yeah, it's very, very true. And um, and again, I just so you are very good at storytelling because <laughs> it is it's, it's a great way to to look at it. Um, and it's not a way that I've heard before. Um, I, I, I got to I'm going to absorb that. <laughs> I got to use that. Um, so tell me then. Uh, Jackson, do you see, uh, especially being at the forefront of a lot of this tech, you know, do you see the importance of data management and the number of jobs working with data increasing or decreasing over the next 10 years and why? I definitely see the number of people who are interacting with data increasing. I I am not sure it's going to be on the persistent side, and right? I don't think it's going to be in the field of databases. I think, I, I think it's going to be around making use of that data, mm -hmm. and being able to uh, recognize when the data structure, as it exists, this source of truth, uh, how I can make use of it intelligently and with the right amount of latency to deliver my end solution. I, I think of the sea change that happened when we moved from relational databases to document stores. And mm -hmm. everybody's like, it's just a primary key lookup. Cool. But then eventually we all realized that all data is relational and we need to do joints. And now all of a sudden my document store falls apart. And the fact that I've denormalized all my data and I've got all these sub objects sitting in there that should have been their own tables. And, and the Oracle DBA is sitting over in their corner laughing at us because he told us this five years ago and now we've had an inflection point and we've got more users than ever and everything's slowing down, it's all, all falling apart. So I feel like data architecture is still very important, but if I look at the way we are letting developers architect their data and then what are the behind the scenes processes machine learning engines that are you know being built off of you know, building models off of the data or in some cases restructuring that data intelligently based on other things that are happening in the system it, it's not too big a shot to imagine that the data architecture that underpins all of this even a distributed system doesn't end up being the way that it starts and that in many cases we might not be responsible for that reorganization the system might be smart enough to say you know what i am going to denormalize this Th this is fine to denormalize that no absolutely not still be needs to be relational so i don't see so much dbas tra the traditional mm -hmm. role of dbas i think if i look at if i look at traditional dba they they want to optimize queries and throw a bunch of switches and 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 be able to toggle things so that they get the best performance out of a query plan. Um, I see a system being able to do that better, right? In the same way that machine learning can identify cancer in skin samples much better than you know traditional physicians. But I absolutely see people needing to 
orchestrate what are the weights in a machine learning model? What, how do I train but not overtrain? That sort of data management, use, testing um, is absolutely going to become critical. I, I look at things like chat GPT and, and GitHub Copilot. And I, I was asked about how do you prepare your, I have two daughters, how do you prepare your kids for, for what's next? Like you're in computers, computers are gonna be important probably. How are you preparing your kids to be ready for that world? I'm like, I'm pretty sure that in 10 years, they can be sitting, you know, they'll be in high school and they'll be like, hey, um, it'd be cool if you went into my shopping cart on DHgate, which is like the Chinese source for like clones and dupes of, you know, big fashion brands, and then sell it on a Shopify site that's mostly pink and is named uh, Cozy's Closet after our cat. And it has a cat logo. And you just say that to like Alexa and then that, and then that store exists, right? And it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody's going to be writing code, but I think the model that made that possible is going to be built on data. It's going to be built on not just data that's sitting at a table, but it's going to be built on code samples and user flows and metrics that come from Google, you know, about conversion rates for different pages and templates. And like, I see all of the data congealing, but there's going to be have to, have to be somebody that at the very minimum builds the first one. Then probably we got a model that can rebuild that model and make it even better and we don't need us at all. And then Skynet happens and then Terminator and Sarah Connor and we've seen how it plays out. But, but in the near future, data yeah. and jobs is going to be around how do you build a contract with machine learning systems to, to you know, sort of codify what goes in so that you understand a little bit about what goes out, what come, what, what's going to come out, and, and maintain that contract because eventually you'll probably have to hand that contract off to another machine learning model that's going to do way better at it than you are. So just be prepared for you know, the contract you're negotiating to change over time. Agreed. And, and yes, absolutely. <laughs> Love that you threw in a Terminator reference there. <laughs> so, so tell me then, what advice would you give to people then looking to get into a career in data management? Understand how sensitive companies are about their data. It's their lifeblood. Right? I may make cars. I may make, I don't know whatever the little hook is that holds my bananas up. I may make all of that, but at the at the core of my enterprise, there is data. My, my, my banana hook is way better than everybody else's because of the years of customer sell-through data that I possess. I know that if I make it in this color, I'm going to sell less of it, right? It's, it's not just product design. It's all of the things around my ecosystem. And they are very, very proprietary about that, understandably. Mm -hmm. um, moving to a new system is scary. Uh, dethroning somebody who has owned, you know, a segment of data is, is a, it's, it's an enterprise challenge. It's a, it's a, it's a mm. challenge of personality. It's a, you know, there's so many politics that happen when you go into an organization and you're, you're a vendor of a solution. You can be right. an architect to help them get there, but I'm not a consultant that's been brought in and empowered to like fire that division. I'm bringing consultants and like, we're going to make this all work you are dealing with personalities and people and human beings that have feelings and they're scared and maybe they don't have the skill set. So how do you kind of help people understand? And storytelling has been my tool for that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, learn how to draw things out real well so that people who maybe don't understand all of the nuts and bolts of a distributed system can see flow and understand that nothing's at risk, nothing's going away, nothing's going to be destroyed, but we're going to make use of it in a new and interesting way and we're going to lower your costs and we're going to make it faster and and your customers will be happier and that will result ultimately in more money maybe um and and that's the that's the story you have to learn how to tell about applications because it's not a web page in a store it's yeah. how did i even choose what products go in there who who curated this who curated my data how did it end up here and and get in their mindset and have empathy around that, even if you think that their execution is highly flawed, 
be able to get them from point A to point B. And that's a lot of times that's POCs that prove one point at a time. And by the end, they're like, I really liked my idea. It was my idea all along. And I'm like, that's the best, that's the best compliment I could ever have. But it was never my idea. I just like, you know, I asked stupid questions and, and until you gave me all the answers that we needed to, to move forward. Oh, that's really good advice. And I think you've given a lot of really good advice along the, telling your telling your story and your journey. I mean, you've been a, tried a lot of different things, but not been afraid to try. You talked about, you know, working through some challenges and figuring out your boundaries. Um, and I think, you know, being honest with yourself about your limitations. And it, it's so important. We've had a lot of those conversations in the podcast about, uh, you know, just the challenges of you know, being honest with oneself and recognizing, and then it's okay to fail and it's okay to learn. And that's how we grow. And uh, it, it's uh, so thank you for, for sharing all of that with us today. You really welcome. appreciate it. And Jackson, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, ask to, if people wanted to look up Harper DB and learn more about what you do, where would they go? Uh, we are online on the internet at harperdb.io and okay. uh, we have a robust slack community for support so if you want to pull down it's, it's free to free to download free to get started um and obviously we're here to help you we have a bunch of templates to help you kind of components that you can drop in and get started mm. doing everything from api gateway to mqtt brokers um, we support um, our developers because at the end of the day we were developers who who Every single one of us found limitations in the products and companies we were working at and yeah. decided to come together and build a solution that made it easier for developers to get from a POC to production without having to throw away everything, you know, halfway through because, because it didn't scale or, or it didn't accommodate, you know, an evolution. And that's ultimately what, uh, what we wanted to create. And I think we've done a good job and I invite everybody to go try it out. Oh, I love that. Our community, I know, loves free uh, trials. <laughs> so we'll make sure and get that out there. Uh, well, Jackson, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. You're very welcome. I really enjoyed it. Likewise. And to all of our listeners out there, if you'd like to keep up to date in the latest in data management education and the latest in podcasts, you can go to dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Until next time, stay curious, everyone. Thank you for listening to Dataversity Talks, a podcast brought to you by Dataversity. Subscribe to our newsletter for podcast updates and information about our free educational webinars at dataversity.net forward slash subscribe. Mm -hmm.